This is Radio 4. It's 11 o'clock. Out of Order, a quiz about politics. In the chair, Patrick Hannon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello and welcome to a special seasonal edition of the show in which politicians attempt to bring us something missing from their trade for the rest of the year. Peace and goodwill. <laughs> Although even those may be sadly lacking if they followed the advice of American political commentator P.J. O'Rourke. Don't send funny greeting cards on birthdays or at Christmas. Save them for funerals when their cheery effect is needed. <laughs> as welcome as Dan Quayle at the Mensa office party, I should imagine. <laughs> Joining us, fresh from the turkey salad and reheated mince pies, are our team captains, the bluff Pickwickian spirit of Christmas past, Julian Critchley, the Tory MP for Aldershot, and someone we think of as the spirit of Christmas present, uh, because we can't get him to wrap up, Austin Mitchell, <laughs> the MP for Great Grimsby. Pulling the other end of their crackers are, with Austin, 50% of our mandatory first-footing Scotsman, Sir David Steele, and with Julian, the all-important red-headed 50%, Robin Cook. <laughs> our scoring system has, for this occasion, been modified to encourage a party atmosphere. Two points for a right answer, one for a funny one, and the losers of each round will have to perform a forfeit, while the lucky winners will get the treat of pulling one of our special backbencher crackers, so-called because they only go off in pairs. <laughs> as, usual, as usual, our first round involves identifying politicians from their quotes, and in deference to the time of year, it has a festive or pantomime feel. Julian Critchley, who's hamelin' it up here? There are now said to be more rats than people in inner London. It's a good job they've not got the vote, as I doubt they would be voting Labour. <laughs> <laughs> well, this must be Norman Tebbit at his most benign, I would <laughs> Well, it or, it, perhaps it ought to be Norman Tebbit, but uh, if I can be helpful at this time of year, you're in the wrong party. Oh, well, you're not in the wrong party, Julie. I, I, I should hate to say that in all the shops. Your answer's in the wrong party. Is it Ken Livingstone? <laughs> it's not Ken Livingstone, no. How about Brian Gould? How about Brian Gould? That was Brian Gould, Labour's environment spokesman, saying there were more rats than people in inner London, a position which could, of course, be speedily remedied by sending them poll tax bills. <laughs> Just because they've been turned out of all the cemeteries. <laughs> I thought, I thought they came with, <laughs> with, oh, with, it. with the transfer. <laughs> Austin Mitchell, who's raking over the cinders of one of this year's events? The Communist Party, the KGB and the Army, the three ugly sisters, are the instruments of control in the Soviet Union. <laughs> Jolly good. Um, <laughs> David Steele's an expert on foreign affairs. Yes, yeah, well, he might know the answer. I, that's I didn't say that, though. No. You are. It, it sounds like an Norman Tebbitism to me, because he should know about instruments of control, but... Uh... Well, it's how suddenly about, more How about or Geoffrey less... Howe, then? No, how about Geoffrey Howe? No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this, this, no, is a, this is a British, not a Russian politician. Really it is right? a British politician. A very distinguished British politician. Douglas Heard? More or less in the same party as Norman Tebbit. Douglas Heard? <laughs> Douglas Heard, yes. You can have a point, uh, Robin. Oh, then, very good. Prime Minister, yeah. Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd commenting during the failed Russian coup earlier this year and comparing its perpetrators to the three ugly sisters, uh, which ladies are presumed uh, to be the original two ug ugly sisters yeah. seasonally adjusted. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Robin Cook, who here comes over all innocence? Is he aware that I cannot congratulate him upon getting this post because it is like the Prime Minister putting Herod in charge of mother care? <laughs> If I can be helpful, we're going back yes, a, few, a few you years, are. not very many. You're, you're, you're going back a few years, and I cannot remember that far back. Uh, uh, it's five years, Robin. Uh, no, I was, I was quite conclusive. I mean, my, my, you're a very young see, man. Yes, I'm a very young man, and I, I, all politicians' minds are programmed to be wiped clean after the last general election, which only takes me back four <laughs> years. Uh, Alan oh, Clark. Alan, it was said about Alan yes, Clark. Alan a point Clark. for you, David. Very good. Thanks Who said it? Clear, clear shot. 
Not Claire Short, though. Somebody uh, with firm views like Claire Short, but... Uh, Dennis Skinner. Dennis Skinner. That was Dennis what Skinner is... addressing Alan Clark on his 1986 promotion to be Minister of, uh, Minister for Trade and Industry, right. comparing it with putting King Herod in charge of mother care. Mr. Skinner later denied that the mother care reference was a cheap jibe at a previous DTI incumbent, Cecil Parkinson. <laughs> when I went back to the House of Commons after my operation and sat in the Commons wheelchair, which I ought to tell my colleagues is available in case this ever happens, <laughs> and I was trying to push myself along, who should come out of his office and shove me along the corridor but the beast of Bolsover? Yes. And yes. it was noticed by two of my colleagues in the Conservative Party who have not spoken to me since. <laughs> and what happened when you and fell to the bottom of the steps? <laughs> And, of course, by three members of the Labour Party, I'm putting Dennis Skinner <laughs> Is it true, Julian, that uh, there is a queue for the Commons wheelchair late at night? <laughs> We're on the verge of a breach of privilege here. Da David Steele, who here warned a colleague to be careful with the sack? He just cannot be allowed to go on rushing round like a demented Santa Claus scattering imaginary tenors from his sleigh. Robin Cook might well know. What a the, the, the source and object of this? No, no, no health minister has ever scattered tenors like this. <laughs> no, this was no health minister. Sorry. No, thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, it wasn't anyone who was one, but it was someone who thought he might be one. This is getting a very difficult programme. We aren't on Radio 3. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it's, terribly it's terribly embarrassing for members of the Labour Party when you're invited to do, uh, remember something that might actually go back to the last Labour government. <laughs> No, it's, it's not the last. The war, it's not David. the last Labour government. It's um, uh, when was that? Uh, you don't. <laughs> Before the last general election. You think you think you have problems? <laughs> I'm to put a stop to this eventually, but uh, uh, let me say that that was a comment. Robin, uh, I know it's their question, but, it, but you might be able to work your way towards this on a. a Former Shadow Secretary for Health and Social Security, as it then was. Uh, well, there only has been one in my lifetime, and that's Michael Meacher. Quite right, yes. That was Neil Kinnock commenting on his erstwhile Shadow, <laughs> shadow Secretary of State uh, for Health and Social Security, Michael Meacher, and his over-generous promises to the electorate, and accusing him of him offering them imaginary tenors, although party policy has now progressed to offering them imaginary £50 notes. <laughs> It's believed that Neil's real objection to Santa Claus is that his red coat and habit of infiltrating homes after dark via the chimney shows a connection with the militant festive tendency. <laughs> so at the end of that round, I regret to report that uh, Austin Mitchell and David Steele have got four points. Julian Critchley and Robin Cook have got no points. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I, I wait, thought wait, they wait. had one. I want a recap. No, I, 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 I have been at sufficient counts to demand a recount. <laughs> I did get Douglas Hurd. I was getting a point for Douglas Hurd. Yes, you were Hurd. You but were. Not I, think, I, think we'll, I think we'll add oh, that. Oh, I see. I think we'll add that. I think the problem is, Robin, that you do well in the polls, but when it comes to the actual election. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want this programme from now on conducted on a strict basis of electoral reform. <laughs> David Steele will explain it later on Radio 3. <laughs> so, the scores are... Uh, 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 seasonally uh, uh, adjusted. <laughs> <laughs> Austin Mitchell and David Steele, four. Julian Critchley and Robin Cook, one. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. means that we open the winner's crackers, we find a lovely crepe, paper, wig and tights, and this riddle, Austin and David, why did David Owen cross the road? <laughs> because he was chicken. <laughs> not bad, not, not bad. The answer is because he always wants to be on the other side. <laughs> the losers, meanwhile, I hope you're all following this, have to pay a forfeit. Julian, uh, first of all, your forfeit is to explain why a 200-seat loss in the general election is a good result for your party. Oh. Well, then, because I should become leader of the opposition. <laughs> <laughs> Under such circumstances, I would have immense patronage. And all those relatives with whom I do not exchange Christmas cards will become knights of the Shire. <laughs> uh, 
and I shall be famous at last. Now, oh, just over a year ago, you just said because the 200 seats would include Finchley. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened to Mrs. Thatcher, by the way? Is she Dickens and Jones on the accessories counter? Or is <laughs> Robin, I, I, I have to give you the, the same forfeit. Uh, why is a 200-seat loss in the general election a good result for your party? You have to explain this. It's only fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, n n n the, the only possible way you can talk yourself out of that 200-seat loss is that, of course, the electoral system is entirely wrong and doesn't require... <laughs> I'm glad I didn't ask David Steele. <laughs> this round asks our teams to repeat what they've no doubt been doing to a captive family at home with, during this festive period, that is, to entertain us with a witty and fascinating anecdote. The subject is, surprisingly, Christmas. To put them in the mood, here's a story related to that subject. In the December of 1948... Various ambassadors to Washington were telephoned by the local radio station and asked what they'd most like for Christmas. Their replies were transmitted, unedited, a week later. I want peace throughout the world, proclaimed the French ambassador. Freedom for all the people enslaved in imperialism, requested the Soviet ambassador. Well, it's very kind of you to ask, responded British ambassador Sir Oliver Franks. I'd quite like a box of crystallised fruits. <laughs> Julian, what does that remind you of? Well, how clever our diplomats are. I can't think of a, a funny reply about Christmas. There's nothing funny about Christmas at all. It goes on and on and on and on. And so I'm, I, I'm with Scrooge on Christmas, but I, I haven't got an anecdote about it. There I'm is, trying well, to get it. Uh, well, I'll give you two points anyway, because it's uh, Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Robin? Well, the best grin I got this Christmas came courtesy of the post office. Uh, the head of the post office in my constituency very sweetly sent me a pen saying post office on it, along with a Christmas card personally signed by her, uh, offering me this pen as a memorial to how excellently the post office served me through the year. Unfortunately, it arrived in this large plastic bag in which it had been secured, which has stamped on the side, Dear customer, I regret that the enclosed item of mail has been damaged during handling by the post office. <laughs> Please accept my sincere apologies for damage and any inconvenience you may cause. Yours faithfully, manager, customer services branch, brackets, RLO, stroke, broken packets, close brackets. Which <laughs> I, I thought rather took away the charm of the personalised touch. <laughs> Austin, what about you? Well, mine isn't a, 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 a true story so much as a, a nightmare, because I'm dreaming of a, of a Euro Christmas, which will almost certainly be served in a, a manger near Maastricht, the one that Jack Delors was born in, uh, with the... the, the Cards translated simultaneously into nine languages, the entertainment provided by the Germans, the cooking done by the British, it'll almost certainly be pizzas because that's the only dish people can agree on by majority vote. It'll be paid for by the Greeks, it'll be served reluctantly by the French with wine grown by the Irish and mainly eaten by the Belgians. And I shall sit there in the corner and drink Advocat, which is a concoction from squeezing Dutch lawyers uh, and get quietly sloshed. <laughs> a sad story. T t two points to you. David Steele. Well, I know I'm in the same team as Austin Mitchell, but I happen to know that's a complete lie because he's going to New Zealand. For <laughs> <laughs> the last free country out of the EC. Oh, I should have deducted right. points from He's carrying his principles dishonesty. through to Christmas. <laughs> Many moons ago, when we had two small children, we were travelling to Kenya for Christmas, and we were due to arrive there on Christmas Eve and attend a service there and have Christmas and all the rest of it in Kenya. Unfortunately, the Heathrow was fog-bound, and we spent uh, most of Christmas Eve on the floor at Heathrow Airport, and then we got into the plane, and Christmas occurred on the flight. My wife was very meticulous about these things, insisted that the children's stockings had to be hung up wherever they were, and they were on an aeroplane. <laughs> Try explaining to children how Santa Claus came down the chimney into the air. <laughs> they got them. <laughs> the winners... <clears throat> Of that round, pulled from their crackers a very fetching junior black rod costume, a bag of chocolate ikku, and this riddle. You were the winners of that round, Julian and Austin. Uh, uh, Julian and Robin, why did Neil Kinnock have to drink 15 decanters of port? Be, no, it's port on the right or the left side of the ship. Depends which no way you're going. There's no, there's, there's, there's you're no port left in it. It's on the left, isn't it? 
Yes, it, yes. Because, yes. He, because he wanted to tilt more to the left? That doesn't sound probable. Well, because he won't pass anything to the left. Ah. Uh, uh, you're very close. Uh, Can I just uh, ask the advice of a member of the Shadow Cabinet? It, uh, Robin, if I get th something like that, what do I say? You're on your own. <laughs> <laughs> As they say in the Labour Party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, uh, David Steele and Austin Mitchell now have to pay the, the, the forfeit, well, the, the traditional forfeit. Austin, first of all, the forfeit is to imagine Roy Hattersley sitting on Mr. Speaker's knee, and you have to tell us what he would ask to find in his stocking. Well, I don't know, but I should want a wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, David, you have to imagine Paddy Ashdown sitting on Mr. Speaker's knee and tell us what he would ask to find in his stocking. He'd want a frogman suit. <laughs> <laughs> this round asks our teams to listen to some comedy Christmas messages from Private Eye, identify the figure impersonated and the year of the record. As is traditional at this time of year, the tracks we have selected are repeats of ones used several years ago. So I'm looking forward to some good excuses should you get the wrong answer. Julian and Robin first, whose message is this? One thing is certain, we cannot afford to tolerate the dinosaur-minded old-school tie rituals and ceremonies which for so long have strangled our production effort in this closing week of the year. I am therefore glad to be able to say that my good friend, the Duke of Edinburgh, who is himself a good friend of Her Majesty the Queen, <laughs> has consented to preside over a tribunal of inquiry under the 1921 Act to take a long, tough, urgent and searching look at this outdated and effete institution of Christmas. I thus feel that the whole vexed issue of Christmas should be regarded from now on as sub judice and that any public or private comment will be regarded as wholly improper. Well, most difficult well, question of the evening, what's it all about? It's John Wells making fun of Harold Wilson. I don't think it's John Wells. No. I think it's John Bird. Oh, John Bird making fun of Harold Wilson. Certainly Harold Wilson is the target. Ooh, do you know um, what date it was? I've got to ask you something more difficult. B66, 67. 1966. Very good, Robin. I think there are two points for you for that. It was... Privatised impression of Harold Wilson from their 1966 record, announcing that he'd set up a tribunal of inquiry to examine Christmas. Needless to say, no one was very surprised when they concluded that if you really wanted to make a season of spending, eating and drinking unpopular, the best way was to nationalise it. <laughs> Austin and David, who is this and from what year? And now, as it's Christmas, um, I'd like the crew to stand on their own feet, if they will, and I'll conduct them in the singing of a little carol we've uh, just knocked up together. God help you merry working men, there's plenty more to pay. With grocer he's the Downing Street and more cuts on the way. He'll bring his little chopper out to make life nice and gay. With tidings of barber and heap, soldier false teeth. Good tidings of barber and heap. Ah. You can say that again. <laughs> David Steele and Austin Mitchell. Well, that, that was the days of Heathcote, wasn't it, in Private Eye? We, 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 think, we think that was uh, a lampoon on uh, Mr Heath. That was Private Eye's version of Edward Heath in 1972, performing a rendition of God Help You Merry Working Man, which may indicate that his policies weren't all that different from Mrs Thatcher's after all. It's believed that one of Mr Heath's most bitter disappointments is that he was never able to work out how to introduce a three-day, 12 days of Christmas. <laughs> At the end of the round, the scores are Austin Mitchell and David Steele, 16, Julian Critchley and Robin Cook, 14. <laughs> Last cracker in the box produces a Kenneth Baker dangerous dog whistle. When you blow it, nothing happens. <laughs> um, because you, you tied on that round, you've all got to do forfeits. Robin Cook first. The forfeit is to tell us what you think Norman Tebbett's New Year resolution will be. To give us a year of silence. <laughs> All right, uh, David Steele, what do you think Boris Yeltsin's New Year's resolution will be? To find a few more republics to join up with. <laughs> Austin, what do you think Margaret Thatcher's New Year's resolution will be? PM by June. <laughs> <laughs> and Julian, finally, what do you think Neil Kinnock's New Year's resolution will be? To, an, to adopt an East of Scotland accent, which is full of rectitude, like John Smith. If he had an East of Scotland accent as opposed to a South Walian accent, Neil would be twice the man. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's why a man brought up in Argyll is accused of having an East of Scotland accent. 
Because he's the son of the man. So is that you, David, who's that's the son me. of the man? Yeah, that's me. Mm-hmm. Our histories are very alike, mm. apart from our future. <laughs> <laughs> and we conclude with our festive squeaker and duck call round, electronically modified to sound like bells and buzzers. The object is for our teams to answer as many as 15 questions as possible in two minutes. The subject is momentous political events that have happened at this time of year. And, lips pursed round our House of Commons Catering Division non-party novelties, we start now. Which self-declared scientist and her husband got the bullet on Christmas Day, 1989? Uh, yes, Austin. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> cheating. Very good. OK, well, uh, Julian. into Romania. Mr. Ceausescu. Ceausescu, yes. Eleanor Nikolai Ceausescu. That's a point to you, or two points to you. Why was the year zero realigned with a normal calendar on the 2nd of January, 1979? Is that... Yes, uh, Robin. That was the year they took over in Cambodia, Pol Pot. Uh, Vietnam invaded Cambodia, yeah. driving out Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge murderers. Which Christmas postmaster wasn't Miss Down Under on the 24th of December, 1974, Austin? John Stonehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Austin's the world's leading expert on John Stonehouse. <laughs> and on that date, 24th of December, 1974, he was arrested in Melbourne, Australia. Who were convicted of trying to cover up Watergate on New Year's Day, 1975? Names? Yes, Julian. Robert Redford. <laughs> <laughs> and his pal Dustin Hoffman. It was no. something like Embel- Engelbert Humperdinck, but it's not. Very like that. Ma- Mi- Coulson, no, Coulson. no, 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 no. Mitchell- Coulson. Charles Coulson. No, that's quite enough for that. Mitchell Haldeman and Ehrlichman. That's what I meant. <laughs> you were very close. <laughs> Which wartime president breathed his last on Boxing Day 1972? <laughs> yes, Julian. Harry S. Truman. Harry S. Truman. Who became members of the EEC on New Year's Day 1973? <laughs> yes, Julian. Great Britain. Well, uh, uh, who else? Readers in Denmark. Who else? Who? 73. Well, else in Denmark. And? Irish. Yes, you can have a point each. Mm. Uh, Brit- Britain, Ireland and Denmark. <laughs> so, that round brings the final scores to Austin Mitchell and uh, David Steele, 23, but Julian Critchley and Robin Cook, 25. <laughs> Which means, after that late burst from Julian, that he and Robin Cook are today's winners. That brings us to the end of the contest and almost the end of the year. But, like that malevolent turkey lurking in the back of the fridge, you can't get rid of a politician as easily as that. Therefore, I'm going to ask each of our contestants to shake off the natural shyness and reticence and perform their favourite party piece. No points will be awarded for this, but there is a strong possibility that bootleg tapes will be on sale at 1992's party conferences. (laughs) Unless, of course, someone beats us to it and makes an illicit rap record of them. (laughs) Julian, first of all, would you like to show us how you lighten the evening round the crackling yew log in Aldershot? Well, I have a limerick which goes down well at the Aldershot Rotary Club. My dear Mrs Ormsby Gore, I really can't cope anymore. I feel quite ill. You're not satisfied still. And look at the time, half past four. (laughs) Robin, can you say what raises an expectant smile on the Cook family estate at Hogmanay? Oh, it's the announcement I'm going to recite Tam Ashanta, but that takes the entire broadcasting time of this program. Uh, So I therefore decided to do this seasonal offering, which often says I can do it as long as I don't attempt a Yorkshire accent. Sam sat cleaning his musket and polishing barrel and butt, whilst Christmas pudding his mother had sent him lay there at his foot in the mud. Now the centre that Sam's lot were holding <coughs> ran round a place called Badajoz, where Spaniards had put up a bastion, and ooh, what a bastion it was. <coughs> they pounded away all morning with canister, grape shot and ball, but face of the bastion defied them, they made no impression at all. And they started again after dinner, bombarding as hard as they could, and the Duke brought his own private cannon, but that weren't a hit so good. The Duke said, Sam, put down thy musket and help me lay this gun true. Sam answered, you'd best ask your favours for them as you give Christmas pudding to. But Sam sniffed with his words, kind of sceptic, and looked down the Duke's private gun and said, we'd best put in two charges, we'll never bust Bastion with one. He took a good right aim at the Bastion and then said, let her fly. The cannon nigh jumped off her trunnions and up went the Bastion sky high. The Duke, he weren't half elated, he danced round the trench full of glee and said, Sam, for this gallant action, you can knot up your Christmas pudding for tea. Sam looked round to pick up his pudding, but it wasn't there, nowhere about. 
In the place where he thought he'd left it, lay the cannonball he'd just tipped out. <laughs> Sam saw in a flash what had happened. By an unprecedented mishap, the pudding his mother had sent him had just flown Badajoz off the map. <laughs> that is why Fusiliers wear to this moment a badge which they think's a grenade. But they're wrong. It's a brass reproduction of the pudding Sam's mother once made. <laughs> Now I see how you fill the period between Christmas and the New Year. <laughs> <laughs> David Steele, how, how do you enliven festivities up at Libel Towers? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, reading from the improving works of the great Scottish bard, William McGonagall. And uh, this is a very appropriate one because it was a tribute to his Member of Parliament, the late Sir John Ogilvy. Alas, Sir John o Ogilvy is dead, aged 87, but I hope his soul is now in heaven. For he was a generous-hearted gentleman, I am sure, and in particular very kind unto the poor. He was a Christian gentleman in every degree, and for many years was an MP for Bonnie Dundee. And while he was an MP, he didn't neglect to advocate the rights of Dundee in every respect. He was a public benefactor in many ways, especially in erecting an asylum for imbecile children to spend their days. <laughs> Then he handed the institution over as free, as a free gift and a boon to the people of Dundee. <laughs> well, finally we come to Austin Mitchell. Now, how do you entertain all your long-lost relatives from New Zealand when they gather round the Steinway at your vast Grimsby mansion? <laughs> well, I thought this year I might sing the karaoke version from... Uh, Robert Maxwell's greatest hits of cruising, but uh, <laughs> I thought as a kind of uh, indication of my post maestric uh, depression that uh, I, I'd like to sing the red flag. I, I've rewritten it uh, for, for European rules. The people's flag is deepest blue, now we support the EMU. Where once its folds were deepest red, we filled the space with Delors head. So raise the twelve star banner high, by Brussels rules we'll live or die. And when the people ask us why, for Mayor Delors is our reply. <laughs> And on that note, or even one in tune, I... <laughs> I've just got time to thank Julian Critchley, Austin Mitchell, Robin Cook and Sir David Steele. Wish you all a peaceful and prosperous new year and leave you with this apocalyptic quote from Tory MP Sir Nicholas Fairbairn. New Year's Day in Scotland is rather what I fancy New York would be like after a nuclear attack. <laughs> Which seems to indicate that his fellow Caledonians would rather run an under four minute mile than look at his colourful dress. Happy New Year and goodbye. Out of Order Christmas Special was presented by a Hollywood act Patrick Hannon with readings by me, Peter Ho 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 Donaldson. The script was written and compiled in Santa's Workshop PLC by Michael Dines and produced under the mistletoe by Diane Messias. And Out of Order returns in the new year. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there's comedy from the archives in the first of five episodes of Hancock's Half Hour. And earlier in the evening, Barry Took hosts part two of the News Quiz of the Year as Richard Ingrams and Ian Hislop take on the rest of the world in the shape of Alan Corrin and Rory Bremner.